It is two o'clock on the California Central Coast on this glorious August Sunday here on the coast as we gather for worship and we are glad that you are with us whether you are zooming in from your home or watching us later on Facebook and YouTube. It is time that we all now gather into this sacred time and hour breathing deeply focusing our hearts and spirits and listening to meditation music played by Kate. Thank you, Kate. Welcome to Safe Harbor Presbyterian, a gathering of friends here to support each other, to grow our faith, to serve the community in the light of Christ, and to be a safe harbor of love and acceptance. And we're glad that you are joining us from wherever you are. Uh, this in the Presbyterian Church is the Sunday that normally is set aside to pray for the unification of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, it is still with us, that uh, conflict from the 1950s. And so uh, if you have a moment today to uh, please reflect on that. Um, I am going to put on my dark glasses because I left my other glasses uh, so that I can read our liturgy. Would you please stand now and join me for the call to worship? Our call to worship is a selection from this week's readings. Uh, the first passage is from Isaiah. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. And now from Jeremiah, is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? And now from the Psalms, rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. And now our prayer of gratitude. Almighty and loving God, you are the one truth of this world the source of all good and every blessing. We have our being in you. In Jesus Christ, you are the guardian of our soul. In all of the days of our life and in the endless eternity, Jesus walks with us. You have given us the light of salvation and our praise rings to the mountaintops. Amen. And our hymn of praise, number 136, Go Tell It on the Mountain.
seated. Let us join our hearts and voices now in our prayer of confession together. God of light, we are called to do the work of mercy and justice and to live and serve as Jesus did. It is not easy and we can be confused. Sometimes we are tested. What did Jesus mean? Where do we align on issues that are divisive? In these moments of silence, we lift up our confusions, even our doubts and despair. We are sorry that we waver and worry or put up roadblocks. And now together, give us the grace to follow and to serve our baptizing Savior to the very end. Help us to keep our eyes on Him so that we may know life's purpose. Amen. Amen. Friends, the great good news of the gospel is this, that as far as the East is from the West, so far has our God removed our sin from us. Alleluia. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. This is the very truth of your life. Sometimes um, when I used to be able to be with you in person and, and often now when I see your faces on the Zoom, at this moment in the service, it, it seems like you don't believe me. It seems like that somehow you think that grace might be a possibility for everybody except maybe not you. And, and what I want to say to you is that you are God's joy and delight. You, yes, little you, yes, little broken you, less, yes, little you that makes the same dumb mistakes over and over and over and over. Yes, you. You are God's joy and delight. God is in love with you. And so when we come before God in worship and at other times and we confess our sin, we release that to God. We don't do that so that God will love us more. We do that because God has already loved us enough and we can release this stuff and not have to carry it with us, not pass it on to future generations. We don't confess our sin to move God toward us. We confess our sin so that the things that block our knowing that we are God's beloved can move farther away from us. So knowing that that is true for you as an individual and knowing that that is true for all of us as peoples, I invite you now to live into that wonder. And to find some safe way, whether you're in person or whether you're online, to share that wonder with each other, um, giving a sign of peace or of love that is beyond all understanding and saying and meaning, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you all. Peace be with you. And now, Addie, if you want to come forward for our prayer ground. Where is she? Is she getting there, still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, good. I want to walk away and leave the church. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. I want you to repeat that to yourself every day for the rest of your life. I will not walk away and leave the church. That is just what we all want to hear. Um, I want to talk with you. You know, you said before worship that um, this week is back to school week and you're getting ready to go back to school and learn new things and uh, be with your friends and all these wonderful things. Well, it's back to school week here where I am too in Alabama. 
3,000 miles away from you. It's back to school time here. And I got an email or a message, actually it was on um, Facebook, a message from a friend of mine that I was in college with way back, way back before even your mother was born. A person that I was in college with, and I went to college at University of Alabama, and she sent this little clip, this little meme that said, in Alabama, there are only two seasons. There's football season and there's waiting for football season. And so down here where I live, uh, football is a big thing. And there are two kind of big football schools in our area. There's the University of Alabama, which is the right school. And there is Auburn University, which is the other school. And whenever football season comes around, everybody just kind of chooses sides. Uh, it didn't, doesn't matter whether you went to that school or not. In this state, you are either an Alabama fan or you are an Auburn fan. And we rib each other and we give each other the business and, and stuff like that. But I want to tell you a secret. We actually know, most of us, know down in our hearts that it doesn't really matter, that God doesn't have favorites, that God, and I can't believe this is coming out of my mouth, but that God actually loves an Auburn quarterback as much as an Alabama quarterback. And as much as we may pray our way through the games, God doesn't care. That division is just for fun. Sometimes it gets out of hand, but mostly it's just for fun. Now, when you go back to school this week, you may find that there are some little divisions that happen in your classrooms. There may be some students that are all friends together and other students that are all friends together. And sometimes those little groups that we get into in school um, can forget that we are really all the same. And we can divide up because of the way we look, or we can divide up because of where we live, or how much money our parents have, or whether we have the cutest clothes on, or all those kinds of things. And, and we can divide up like that. And, and it can cause a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And so in this morning's lesson that I'm going to read from scripture, it's really, really, really hard to understand. It's hard for grownups to understand. And it's really hard for kids to understand because it sounds like what Jesus is saying is that he likes those divisions. But what I want you to remember is that what Jesus is really saying is that sometimes when we act in love toward people who maybe somebody is being mean to on the playground or something, when we reach out in love, sometimes the mean people may be mean to us as well. But it's really important for us to remember that all our divisions don't matter. We, we are all precious to God. And if you see somebody being bullied, or if you see somebody just, you know, somebody being mean to somebody, as a Jesus person, it is your job to be loving and kind anyway. And it may, you know, it may be uncomfortable, but that's who we are. And when you said just a little while ago, I would never walk out of the church. Well, you are the church walking in your playground. And so when you're there, just remember that everybody is loved equally by God. And don't let people be mean to other people if you can stop it. Okay? 
So we'll say a repeat after me prayer. And then when you go back to your pew for your drawing today, I want you to draw uh, pictures of all of the friends that you're going to be with in school this week and ask God to bless them. And even draw pictures of new friends that you haven't even made yet and ask God to bless them too. Okay? Well, um, um, Eugenia? Yeah? Yeah. Third grade and second grade in my class at this recess at the same time while I'm playing. And I know who those are, people. Yay. Well, so you know how many wonderful people you have to play with and to pray for. So will you uh, fold your hands and say a repeat after me prayer? Yes. Dear God, Dear God, we thank you for school starting. We thank you for loving hearts. We thank you for loving hearts. Loving heart. And new friends. And new friends. Help us to love and accept everybody. Help us love and accept everybody. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Jesus. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Addie. You can go back to your pew. And now let's prepare ourselves uh, for uh, hearing the word by singing together, Open the Eyes of My Heart. <laughs> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see who high and lifted up, shining in the light of your your power and love as we sing holy 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 i want to see you years ago I kept a list of things that I wished Jesus never said. I have long ago lost that list, uh, but it included, as I recall, such notables as woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, love your enemies, or return to no one evil for evil, or pick up your cross because you have to die to live. And without a doubt, today's passage, if it wasn't on that list, it was an oversight on my part. It is a passage that almost defies translation because it is so shocking and so passionate and so urgent that we don't seem to have tenses in English with which to convey its real meaning. It's one of those texts that if read uh, without study can have one of two results. It can either have the dearly devout uh, run screaming from the room or else they will find in it, we will find in it, justification for every kind of vile meanness in our own unhealed hearts. It's a tough one, and it can only be understood when viewed through the lens of love, because here's the thing, uh, the Bible cannot be understood unless it's viewed through the lens of love. It, it, you know, we, we can't do it any other way. 
So in an attempt to avoid either y'all running screaming from the sanctuary or from your uh, computers, uh, or to avoid you finding in these words a way to justify something in your own heart that is not justifiable in order to help us kind of keep that lens of love uh, in front of us as we hear the text. This Sunday, I'm going to read it for you with a bit of commentary as we go along. Uh, but before I read it, I, let me remind you that this text is essentially, this passage is, essential, is essentially descriptive and not prescriptive. Jesus is describing reality rather than setting a hoped for agenda. Now, I, I have more commentary on your study sheets that Monty set out with you, so you can look at that uh, later if you want it. So with, with that much in mind, listen for the word of God. Our ears are open and our hearts are ready to receive. Reading from the 12th chapter of Luke, verses 49 through 56. Verse 49. I came to bring fire to the earth. Now, this is me, my commentary. The image of fire in scripture is important, especially for Luke, who's the author of today's passage. And it carries two main meanings. On the one hand, it refers to judgment for purification. Fire burns away in the soul everything that is not love and not loving. It's not punishment as such, although the perfecting of our moral character can sometimes feel like punishment. It is rather always, always, always medicine for wholeness and for reconciliation. And the second meaning of fire in Luke is that it symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Think the tongues of fire that rest on the heads. Think of the purifying of our thinking uh, at Pentecost in Acts, also written by Luke. These meanings are how Jesus can then say, after he says, I long for fire, he can say, and how I wish it were already kindled this purifying love out of us, of everything that is not love. Verse 50, he says, I have a baptism. Now, this baptism refers to his coming passion. Um, baptism, as you all know, is always a dying. But while it is accompanied with grief, it is always also purposeful. Baptism takes a person somewhere, even if it seems to kill us. Jesus says, I have a baptism with which to be baptized. And what stress? Now, this word is the word not for anxiety, like we often talk about stress, but it's for the stress of uh, like a metal that is at its breaking point. I am under such stress. I am under it until it is completed, he said. Now, one other thing to remember as you're reading the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, that when you see an exclamation point at the end of the sentence, that indicates that, that English does not have a tense with which to express the power and the passion of what's being said. Verse 51, do you think that I've come to bring peace? Now, here Jesus is speaking of that pseudo peace or the lack of conflict that exists with the unexamined allegiance to the status quo. Do not think, he says, that I have come to bring peace to the earth. No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. 
They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Okay, he's telling his listeners that following him in the days of lies and violence and oppression, resisting an oppressive status quo will result in choices that can rend even the most solid relationships. So verse 54, he also said to the crowds, now he's not just talking to his friends, to us, he's now talking to everybody. It includes onlookers, it includes his enemies. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it's going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. And he's referring here to common meteorological occurrences in Palestine in his day. Without the weather channel, people were students of the changes in the weather, and they acted according to those patterns. Verse 56, you hypocrites. Now that word was originally the word for stage actors. And by the time of Jesus' day, it referred to someone who wore a mask to hide behind. Someone who impersonated someone else because who they were was not fit to reveal even to themselves. And Jesus continues, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not interpret or discern the present time? And the word that he uses here for time is kairos, not chronos. Chronos is clock time. Um, kairos is right time, necessary time fullness of time, time that gives one an opportunity to act. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, okay. Uh, that's a hard one for us to unpack, isn't it? On the surface, it just sounds like the worst family reunion ever. Or it sounds like a, a grisly snapshot of our national life. Or like Jesus is wishing literal fire down on parched California hills. But here's the thing. It is a lot simpler and a lot harder than that. In the midst of a section urging preparedness, as Jesus sees where his earthly life is taking him, he stops and he says to his friends, his onlookers and his enemies, he says, don't be surprised. This is what happens when you challenge the status quo. It is what happens when you take a moral stand for the actual moral Jesus and not just the one that you have domesticated to be either the desired anesthetic of the day or the desired energy boost that you need in order to get you something you want or fend off something you don't want. On his way to his death, as he always was every moment of his life, on his way to his death, Jesus stops and says, I have not come to validate your social realities or your blind structures. And if you're going to follow me, you have to be ready to take a stand that a lot of people won't like. 
the wonderful Presbyterian preacher Terry McDowell Ott in writing about this passage tells a story from the Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech of a great Jewish theologian, mystic, advocate, and survivor of Auschwitz, Elie Wiesel. In that speech, Wiesel remembers a young Jewish boy from his time in Auschwitz. Can this be true? The bewildered boy asked his father. This is the 20th century, not the Middle Ages. Who, who could allow such crimes to be committed? How could the world remain silent? Bazell responds to this boy's question in his speech, swearing never to be silent when and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. Wiesel says, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the, encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. That is a haunting story in our times, isn't it? is even more haunting story when standing under the cross, wearing our crosses around our necks, our dog collar around our necks, filling, you know, filing into worship in our clean clothes or sidling up to our contemporary, you know, to our computers and our jammies. It's even more haunting claiming Jesus as our savior and listening to his passionate calling to us from today's passage as he makes his dusty way to death for us, it is even more haunting to hear Bissell's words in the circumstances of our own lives. It is haunting to examine our own lives. How many times, y'all, have we been immobilized because the road seemed too tough and we felt too small? How many times have we left an injustice in yesterday's news bin because we thought we weren't equipped to meet the challenge? How many times have we kept silent at a racist or homophobic joke at the neighborhood barbecue because we didn't want to cause a fuss? How many times have we chosen to say nothing when something needed saying? How many, how many times have we talked over, made excuses? dismissed or demeaned someone when what was called for was a deep soul listening that might burn the holy fire of conviction into our own hearts and point us toward the change that the moment demands of Jesus followers. Too many times for me, I'll tell you. I remember when I was a pastor in Birmingham in the old historic First Presbyterian Church to whose pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King wrote his famous letter from the Birmingham jail along with others. While he, Dr. King was incarcerated just across the street from the church and looking at the church's beautiful spires from behind his bars. I remember sitting on the steps and looking and reading that letter. And in that letter, King insisted that there is no neutrality in the face of injustice. Staying silent or not taking sides in the face of oppression is never neutral, never. It is an action. It is a choice. Doing nothing 
to disrupt oppression supports the oppression. In his letter, King insisted that the status quo of a segregationist system must be spoken against and actively disrupted if it is to change, to do nothing, to stay silent, to prefer, as King wrote, a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, meant siding with the segregationists. The white moderates, according to King, were a greater stumbling block in the fight for freedom than the Ku Klux Klan in, in the ways that moderates derail direct action through their paternalistic critiques and calls to wait for a more convenient time. King loved the church, but he bemoaned the ways Christians have scarred the beloved community through social neglect and the fear of being nonconformists. I remember one late spring evening, sitting on the front steps of Old First Church, reading this letter, glancing across the street where the jail once stood. It was then, by then, a yuppie wide MCA. Um, I remember sitting on those steps that evening and the women who sat on those steps during the day as a needed sanctuary from their homelessness and the violence of the city had just filed into the church basement for their hot and a cot. I remember thinking again, as I had before, that basements are where we keep things we don't want to see, but can't quite find a way to throw away. And I remember that night, I felt like the blood in my veins reversed. And I thought of which parishioners of mine would toddle off in outrage if we went forward with our plans to expand our shelter and expand our services. I wondered which parishioners would toddle away in outrage just as half of the congregation had toddled off when the pastor in King's Day responded to the letter by throwing open the doors of the church to all people. The thought of that moment this week as I worked up this text, we, we always have to choose, y'all, and division will inevitably result. What Jesus tells us here is that there are moments, there are times, there are kairos moments when we have to decide whose side we are on, when we have to read the signs of the times and get on the right side of history. There are times and they can cost. Safe Harbor as a congregation has faced just such a time in the not too distant past, a time when prejudice could just not be tolerated and silence meant would mean siding with the oppressor. There are times y'all, and you know, it is not, it is not always in those big moments when, when the letter from Dr. King comes, it's not always in those big moments when, when it becomes clear that our understanding of the gospel's welcome doesn't fit where we have sat in a pew for, you know, 20 years. It is not just those moments. It's not just the big moments where choices have to be made. It's not only the big cosmic stands that we find ourselves dealing with. Maybe Maybe you are like me and you found yourself struck silent at a family gathering or a town hall meeting or a church social in the presence of ideas repugnant to the gospel, struck silent from um, a fear of reprisal or ridicule and, and let something you know is wrong stand unchallenged. Maybe in in the presence of a family change or crisis, you felt buffeted 
in the presence of wildly divergent opinions as to how to move forward. And in that you just froze. I experienced that earlier this week myself. You all know, and I thank you for your prayers that my mother has been in the hospital. She's 96 and her conditions, while not immediately life-threatening, are indeed end-of-life conditions that cannot be reversed. When this was explained to Mama on Monday in the hospital, she declared that she wanted to come home to this house where I now sit, this house that she lived in for 60 years with my father, this house in which he was born. She declared that she wanted to come home to this house to die. Now she shared this with me along with detailed instructions about what she wanted done by Facebook Messenger, by the way, but that's a story for another day. Well, Robbie and I hopped too, and we got storage units and we hired movers and we broke down my office and we moved out our furniture in the front bedroom of the house where she wanted to come. There were some issues though. Hospice said that she would need round the clock sitters and that Robbie and I could not provide the level of care ourselves. The cost of sitters alone would be $12,000 a month. There was just no way. So as we were trying to figure something out, I got opinions from all quarters. Her closest friends and other family members said that we should mortgage our house to pay for her care. Her doctor said people deserve to die where they want to. My friends were saying, Eugenia, you can't have all those caregivers coming in and out of your house when you are still under doctor's orders to isolate. And to top it all off, Mama kept saying, but you promised me, you promised me. How do we make those kinds of decisions? Bizel's quote haunts me as I recall times that I have sat silently knowing I should speak, but unable to find the words or the courage to say them. Bizelle's quote also lights a fire in me, inspiring me to speak, to take a side, to stand firmly with the oppressed and against the oppressor, even if I'm included in that latter category. But the problem comes when the Jesus thing is not clear. The problem comes if there is more than one right choice. The problem comes when there is, um, you know, at least one or more least wrong choices, or if there are no right choices in our control, only less wrong ones, then what? Then you've got families divided, communities divided, and your own heart divided like mine has been this week. So, so what do we do? Do we just go back earlier in this chapter and sigh and say, you know, consider the lilies of the field, they toil not, neither do they spin? Well, I don't, I'll admit I've been repeating that on a loop all week. Our text before us today, unfortunately, for our let's just do it minds, as I said earlier, is descriptive rather than prescriptive. It does not tell us who is right and who is wrong. It doesn't give us a 10-step plan to fix everything and end up sitting in a circle with daisies in our hair singing kumbaya. But there is some comfort, I think, in seeing the picture of human confusion and division as it is, especially in the larger context of this passage about watchfulness. It can be helpful to be reminded that the ways of Christ can divide before they unite. And that it is 
on his way to a public execution that Jesus tells us that. And it can be helpful to remember that after that cross, after that division, after that public execution, at least in the macro, if not in the micro, the rupture is healed. The tomb is empty. Jesus is back in his garden. Y'all, with the gift of the Holy Spirit that he so longed for us to experience in the first verse of today's passage, we have a patch of light to stand in as we make the impossible consequential stands in our lives, in our churches, in our communities, in our nation, and in our world. We won't always make some kind of ultimate right as opposed to every other possibility being wrong choices. But when we stand for Jesus and his values of love in any situation, we can be assured that even if the path is rocky, we are not on it alone. Perhaps, perhaps the worst possible choice is to not choose at all. Worse than choosing wrongly or finding out later that we were so convinced of being right that what we were so convinced of being right either wasn't or didn't really matter at all. What is worse is to be so immobilized by possible consequences that we do nothing at all. Jesus was never a fan of the lukewarm. He'd rather we be wrong than tepid. So maybe the deepest core of this text is, is Jesus pleading with us to just care, to take a stand for love. As, as William Blake says, we are put on earth for a little space that we might learn to bear the beams of love. Maybe, maybe what is splitting Jesus apart, what is testing his metal here is the need for us to rupture something, to, to rupture a habit or a fear or our shame or our confusion so that the light can shine in and a, and a plant can push its way through the cracks in a sidewalk and bloom despite all the odds. Because here's the thing, y'all, a ministry, a congregation, a life that is built on reconciling long-standing enemies like the Jesus life that is built on the radical notion that not every rupture is fatal, that not every division is an abomination, that while Jesus clearly calls for us to be united, he also in John 12, 31 tells us that he himself is the crisis. He is the one that sorts, that cuts away the chaff, that purifies the heart of all that is not love, even if it is our own illusions about love. Now, please do not hear me advocating all disruption as a holy tool. It is clearly not that. There is sick division and there is healing division. Violence and extremism are evils that have to be confronted which may, with means that are other than their own. No questions. But there are holy divisions that we walk through with a measure of humility, particularly in these days when we see people claiming to follow Jesus, saying and doing and defending things that make the rest of us cringe. We know, if we have any humility at all, what we don't know. But we also know what we do know. What Jesus is saying here is that when holy division begins, not this awful power-grabbing, self-righteous posturing, but when holy rupture begins, 
the gospel of love is breaking out right there. And we have to take a stand to the best of our ability. You know, as I think about all this, maybe there's some prescription here as well. Maybe it is to not be afraid of the divides, of the cracks in the sidewalk that we, those, the sidewalks that we thought were, were solid and that we see are now vulnerable, not to be afraid of the divides, but to be the light that lets the new growth come. Maybe the prescription is to change our strategy for dealing with the vision, to move from blame and posturing to the outrageous mission of catching others even our opponents in the act of doing the right thing once in a while and acknowledging that with genuine love and gratitude. I remember one time when I was growing up, my dad once told me that his life mission was looking for the things I did right and telling me that that's who I am and that that and that who I am is what the world wants and needs. Think about that. What if we decide that we want to meet division with that, with that kind of love? If we do that, we'll stop being followers of Jesus and we'll become his apprentices. Maybe that's the prescription. Maybe then when we know that we know that we know that we are God's joy and delight ourselves, that we are just what the world wants and needs, and so is everybody else, maybe then and only then can we see crisis as opportunity. Maybe, maybe only then will we become the fire. Maybe only then will the purifying fire of spirit, love, burn in us. Maybe only then will we be able to read the signs of the times without having to wear the stultifying masks of our own prejudices, insecurities, wounds, and past mistakes. And we can then turn unholy division into a demonstration of the kingdom of God. Maybe the simple, not so simple prescription hidden in the description in this text is to not allow our hearts to grow cold, to grow cold with ease and with easy answers and with fear and with overwhelm with the need for a way out. Maybe the simple, not so simple prescription is don't hide, don't freeze, don't run, and above all else, don't be tepid, because y'all tepid is useless and often supports a status quo that is held up on the unseen pillars of moral evil, evils cleverly disguised or else dressed in the cloaks of exceptionalism and personal moral perfection, or worse yet, the debilitating lie that we and others are undeserving of grace as if deserving has anything whatsoever to do with grace. The times we live in simply cannot bear those masks to live behind y'all. So I say today, come Holy Spirit, strip us bare of all that is not love, burn the masks and lies until we clearly see the way to walk wherever it takes, to across or beyond. Burn the masks until there is nothing left but love to share. Come Holy Division. Come Holy Spirit. Come. Thanks be to God. Our prayer, our um, hymn of response is number 724, O oh, Jesus, I have promised.
gods prepare our hearts for prayer by singing our chants, Come and Fill. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill, and our, fill hearts our hearts with your peace. Hallelujah. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Hallelujah. As we prepare for prayer today, um, there are so many people in our congregation and in our hearts, our extended um, flock that um, are in need of prayer today. Um, we think especially today of Michelle's sister and her family and the loss of her child and the difficult path of grieving. Um, we think of Claudia's son and his new wife in their first uh, weeks of married life together. Um, we pray for Jeanette, who um, can't be here to worship with us anymore. And always we think of Julia's mom, Claire, uh, who can't get out to be in worship any longer. Um, we pray for Jack and Marzano and his continued recovery. Um, we pray also for uh, members of our extended, our YouTube uh, congregation, Marielle and Warren Hansen, um, who worship with us online and are uh, dealing with, the, with grief and the loss just a couple of weeks ago of their 51-year-old son, and they're preparing for his memorial service on August the 20th, and so we pray for strength and comfort and um, just supernatural strength for for that whole family and I know that there are other things that um, that I don't even know about and but you do and God does so let us come before the our Lord in prayer let us pray amazing and precious God Sometimes when we sit in the presence of your word and we unpack what it really means, um, we think it would almost be easier to not know, but we do know. We know that we belong to you. And we know that the more that shows in our lives, the more, you know, resistance we may experience. We know that we all always don't know what's right. And, and so we ask that you just help us in our choosing. Uh, and if we choose wrongly, at least don't let us hurt anybody. We pray, oh God, that you will plant within us that little seed that got planted in my little girl's heart so many years ago with my dad. Help us to have eyes to look for the good in people even our opponents, even people that are doing things that we think are unthinkable, even if all we can see is that buried within them is a, a common humanity made in your image. Help us to look for the right and support it. Help us to look for love. Help us to tell your children that they are your joy and your delight and that God is not, and that you are not mad at them, that you are just, that you just look for the good in them. Help us to be you and not just worship you. Help us to be like you in how we deal with the world. Oh, gracious God, we feel so helpless sometimes in the presence of the great injustices in our communities and our histories. We, we feel so helpless in, in the presence of family schisms and, and people who just, you know, when we have to make decisions and none of them are good. And so we ask you and trust that you are already in the midst of it all, that you are weaving everything together as St. Julian said, and that all will be well and all will be well and all manner of things will be well. So we lift up to you all of our loved ones 
who are in need of a special measure of your presence, your devotion, your care, your healing power, your comfort. We lift them all up to you as we bind up our prayers in the words that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, art in heaven hallowed be, hallowed be thy, thy, name, thy kingdom, thy, kingdom come, come, thy, will, thy be done, will be done on earth, on earth in heaven. Is in heaven. Give, give us this day, day our daily bread, bread. and forgive us and our debt as we forgive, as we forgive those. those. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our prayer response is number 710. We are an offering. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here, to hear this message, receive your gifts. We dedicate them to you. We dedicate our lives to you. We listen and look for your guidance to handle each day. And we thank you for directing us, all of the lives, all of our lives, as we come to this point and we look forward for your direction and love and support for the rest of our lives on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And our hymn of parting is number 775, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. and brothers in Christ. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, 
and superficial relationships so that you will live deeply and from the heart. And may God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that you will work for justice, freedom, and peace. And may God bless you with tears to shed for those that mourn so that you will reach out your hand to them and turn their mourning into joy. And may God bless you with just enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this whole world so that you will do those things that others say cannot be done. And now may the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the amazing love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us this holy day and forever. Amen. Amen. for everything. Those of you who are on Zoom or even in the sanctuary, if you want to hang out and visit for a few minutes, that's great. Sanctuary folk, I can feel the lemonade and cookies calling you, so I will, <laughs> understand, um, I will understand that. I want to thank everybody that um, made our worship possible today, and especially I want to thank everybody worshiping today. Your choice to worship it's not just a gift to our congregation. It changes the world. Amen. Inch by inch, Amen. God uses our worship to change the world. Good to have Amen. you all with us. So, nice to hear you, Patricia. Yeah, so wonderful to Thank hear you. His voice. Miss you, Jeff. Nice to see you. <laughs> Or your little figurine. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'll get oh, dressed Patty. next week. <laughs> Who have you got? Whose who's picture have you got there? This is the, the, this is this is me with a. Are my friends from school? Right here where I'm playing is that me? Yeah. And then right here is Nico. Yeah. And then the right here is Sophia, and then right here, over here where the slide is, is Jenny. Oh, those are wonderful friends. I'm going to add them to my prayer list, too. So that's great. Thank you, Addie. There's one boy and there's, there's uh, four girls. Four girls and one boy. Uh, three girls and one boy. Three girls and one boy. God bless him. That's right. <laughs> oh, I want to hear about the wedding. <laughs> <laughs>